Hello, I'm Neil Bradley, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and welcome to our latest edition of Back to Business, Conversations with Our Nation's Leaders, where we're getting to know the freshman members of Congress. Today, we're going to venture to America's Pacific Northwest and spend a little time with Congressman Marilyn Strickland, who represents Washington's 10th Congressional District. In her freshman term, Congresswoman Strickland uh, originally was born in Seoul, South Korea, making her one of the first uh, uh, individuals of uh, Asian American uh, descent uh, elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and the first African American woman to represent Washington State in Congress. But she's no stranger to the Washington area. She grew up in the South Sound, graduated from Tacoma Public Schools, and got her undergraduate degree from the University of Washington. She's also no stranger to public service and the business community. Prior to her election in Congress, uh, Congresswoman Strickland served as mayor of Tacoma, and she also served as president and CEO of the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, really bridging the intersection of economic development, business, and government. It's that kind of common sense attitude of building bridges that she brings to her service here in Washington, D.C. Today for our conversation, we're going to be joined by our friend Tom Pearson, the president and CEO of the Tacoma Pierce Chamber of Commerce. Interestingly, they work together as a business leader and mayor and as two chamber leaders working to make a better economic environment for the people on, in America's Pacific Northwest. So with that, Congresswoman Strickland, thanks for joining us today. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. And I really appreciate that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is interviewing freshmen because as I'm someone who's new to Washington, D.C., but not new to politics, it's nice to have an opportunity to share with you my story and then some of the things we're working on. Well, fantastic. Let, let me start with how are you finding it? You're a little over six months in now, uh, you know, getting settled in in Washington. It's uh, not the normal freshman experience uh, getting elected in a pandemic, but how are you finding things? Well, you know, I tell folks that I am a freshman in Congress, but I'm not a rookie to politics, having served as mayor for two terms and also as a chamber executive. And so as I think about, you know, what these first six months have been, you know, when you go to Congress, you are there because you want to deliver for the people at home. But we've had some very, you know, trying times. We are still in the midst of a pandemic, doing our best to get people vaccinated. We are still trying to come out of an economic crisis. And on January 6th, there was an insurrection to overturn an election. So it's been even to say the least, but also very, very productive. So um, one of the things that when we first learned that you were running for Congress, that we were just fascinated by your background, in addition, of course, to being you know, a, a chamber leader, just the emphasis that you placed in your time as mayor of uh, an attracting investment that could spur job creation, something like over a billion dollars in investment, spurring over 40,000 new jobs created, uh, in your your time as mayor, and you know f those numbers, I think probably actually undertell the importance of what it means to attract investment and create jobs. So one of the questions we want to ask you, and we've asked your colleagues as well, is uh, to to lead us off by telling us what a job means to the people in the tenth congressional district, and why you've been so focused over your career in attracting that investment to make job creation a reality. Great. Well, thank you very much for that question. You know, and what we did during my time in Tacoma with a lot of amazing partners in both the public and private sector is that we built momentum to make large public investments to attract private investment. And that's what you saw happening in Tacoma. So when I think about what a job means to the 10th Congressional District or what it means to me personally, it's pretty straightforward. Um, first and foremost, is it is acknowledging that there is a dignity in all work, period. And when you think about a job, a job is a way to make a living. It is a way to be treated with respect and dignity. It is a way to retire comfortably and with dignity. And it's a way to have your basic needs at a minimum. And the story I often tell is that my father served in the military for over two decades. And we always had a roof over our head, food on the table, access to health care, and comfort in knowing that he and my mother would retire with dignity. That's not true for too many people. So for me, a job encompasses all those things. 
I, I want to bring our friend Tom Pearson in here because I know he thinks about this the same way. He and I have had these conversations. I'm sure you and Tom have had conversations about the importance of, of job creation uh, here. Uh, Tom, w how important is it to have uh, local elected leaders and now a member of Congress who thinks about jobs in, in those kind of terms? Yeah, I think it, I mean, it's critical when you, when you look at the work that, that Congresswoman Strickland and I worked together with on projects. I mean, it was, it was, wasn't about party lines. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's when we talk about these jobs, you know, jobs aren't Republican or Democrat. And right. when we're working on these projects, they're not Republican or Democrat. That's one of the things I, I appreciate Congresswoman as she was mayor is she'd reach a part, you know, across and, and it's a nonpartisan position at that point. Right. So you, you're working with Republicans, Democrats, with labor, with chamber, with business and so forth and to create that common good and and creating those jobs, those, you know, workforce jobs. Right. So good family paying with jobs that matter to not only our region, but to the nation as well. Yeah. So, uh, Congresswoman, you, you talked a little bit about your, your family and kind of growing up and how that influenced um, your thinking about economics. But talk to us about some of the other influences uh, in your life that have kind of shaped your thinking and, and your vision of leadership, particularly as it relates to public service. Yeah. So, you know, when you are when you decide to be a public servant, you are there to try and make life better for the people that you represent. And you know, I often say that when local government is working the way it should, it's not in the news because governing is boring and mundane. You work on everything from you know getting roads fixed to making sure that the garbage is taken out, making sure that the lights come on, even making sure that sewer systems are working. Not exactly sexy, you know, bumper sticker type topics. But in the context of jobs and the economy, we have to come back to the fact that we have to have people people's basic needs met. And often people who work in the public sector are customers that support businesses. Large businesses often do a lot of procuring and purchasing that benefits small businesses. And so when we think about jobs and businesses, I really don't like the narrative that paints big business against small business because it is a giant ecosystem of public, private, large, medium, and small businesses that all work together. And we have to find ways for all of them to thrive so that at the end of the day, we're providing jobs that provide a living wage, good healthcare benefits, access to a decent retirement, and again, the ability to go to work every day and be treated with respect and dignity. Yeah, that, that, I, I, I beamed when you said the word ecosystem, because that's actually a word at the U.S. Chamber that, that we use a lot. We're proud to represent the interests of the nation's largest businesses and some really small businesses on Main Street and through yeah. uh, friends uh, like, like Tom and our Federation of State and Local Chambers, uh, we get to understand the interests of a whole lot of businesses uh, who never make it to Washington, D.C. to lobby their member of Congress or advocate. And if we don't think about all of their interests being conjoined together and that our fate uh, being conjoined together in terms of what our economy does, we're, we're really missing um, the opportunity for the growth in our economy, in our uh, personal well-being uh, that we all want to want to see possible. So uh, I'd love to hear you say that. I'm, I, I got I asked about influences. So let me let me let me be even more specific about it. Um, okay. Is there a particular book that's influenced you or maybe a favorite book? Uh, and if so, um, what is it and why? Well, you know, I think about the types of books that I like to read, and I tend to be a binge reader. So if I find a book that is just compelling, I will literally read it cover to cover within you know a week. And so this isn't necessarily, quote, pertinent to economics, but there's this beautiful book written by Min Jin Lee. She is a Korean American author, and it's called Pachinko. And it is a sweeping story about a family that is... Korean that had to live in Japan during the 1900s. And I say that this book is really important because for a lot of people, they do not understand the history of Asian Americans in the community. And I thought the thing first, we recently passed an anti-Asian hate crime bill. And some of the things you see happening in the country now really need to be addressed. And so if more people knew the history of the different Asian groups, and I happen to be Korean American, I think there's just so much unity we can have and how we can find out mutual benefits that help all of us. And so as I think about Pachinko, it tells a story of a Korean family that had to live in Japan during the 1900s. It talked about the sacrifices that they made. And it also just talked about, you know, what 
what had to happen for them to thrive. Yeah, and, and so are, are there some great lessons? Um, what one we should we should pick up this book. Um, yeah. And, uh, two, uh, are there any great lessons that you think we would we would take away from it? Yeah, you know, I would say that, you know, when we think about different communities that exist within our economic ecosystem, we have businesses of all sizes. And, you know, the Asian American community historically has been very entrepreneurial for many reasons, and often it's out of necessity. And, you know, I take such great pride in the fact that the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber of Commerce, in its mission now, talks about being the most equitable and inclusive place to do business in Washington state. That is a bold statement for a chamber of commerce to make, but it also means a deeper understanding of the different people and the different cultures that make up our entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so for me, it's a way to illustrate, you know, you often try many times and you fail when it comes to economic development. It also means that sometimes there are just obstacles you have to overcome, but also just the spirit of trying to run a business is something that requires so much sacrifice. And I think people sometimes forget that even if someone is a business owner and a small business owner, they're not necessarily rolling in dough. A lot of personal sacrifice, especially personal financial sacrifice, comes into taking that chance to be a small business owner. Yeah, it's often really personal risk and family risk. That's right. Uh, Tom, the Congresswoman mentioned a part of uh, your mission statement there at the Tacoma Pierce. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, as we're, you know, we're walking through the pandemic and with all all the issues that surround um, the issues of race in our community, it was clear that being where we were, you know, whether it was me personally or us as an organization of being against racism wasn't enough, right? So we needed to be working towards making our organization to be anti-racist. And, um, you know, I actually just read a book how to, you know, how to be anti-racist, right? And so really working, understanding, and we spent a lot of time listening and learning, right? And and walking through this, and now we're pivoting into how do we help our businesses towards that direction? How do we help businesses? You know, we, we started up a black owned, black only um, incubator, accelerator, and to really focus in on those businesses that through systemic racism, haven't had the opportunities that other, individuals and businesses have had. So it's, um, we can go deep into it, Neil, but, but that's, that's, it's, it's really taken us, you know, everything, whether it's transportation, how do we make, you know, whether it's, um, instead of just being shovel weather ready, is it shovel worthy? And so really taking that anti-racist into all our policy work that we're moving forward with. Congressman, how, how is that translating into the work that you're doing in, in Washington? This is obviously a, a, a priority, I suspect, for you. How do you see that translating into, into your policy work? Oh, well, it is completely relevant. And, you know, I have the privilege of serving on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And as you know, we are working on a big infrastructure package. And you know, as we're talking about making these investments, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars of investments, we have to make sure that those investments benefit everyone. And not just the people who are going to work on these large public works projects, you know, we want to make sure that the minority and women owned business community benefits from these as contractors. I was really proud to introduce the a resolute, a, um, an amendment to the American Apprenticeship Act, where we are focusing specifically on recruiting from ignored and underserved communities, women, minorities, people coming out of foster care, to ensure that they're getting access to registered apprenticeships to be ready for these jobs and infrastructure. We're making sure that the SBA is working with minority and women-owned businesses so that they can be part of the supply chain and all the things we're going to need to invest in infrastructure. And so it is a big opportunity to really help more communities of color build wealth and address the wealth gap, but also making sure that everyone participates in this, or as the Tacoma Chamber says, an equitable and inclusive economy. I love it. I love it. You've talked uh, about some of the things that you've already been able to accomplish in, in seven months and some of the things you're working on. Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't have to tell you two years is going to fly by like that. Um, yep. And so, you know, in less than two years, we'll be having a similar conversation to this, hopefully in person uh, in a post pandemic world. Um, and we're going to be talking about your priorities at that moment. But I'm wondering if if you could imagine that scene, what is it that you hope to be talking about that you achieved in your first term that you're trying to build on? And so uh, any particular goals that you've laid out that you, you hope to see achieved uh, by the time you start your second term? 
Yeah, well, as Tom knows, I am, um, I'm not shy about setting big audacious goals. And one of the things that we're experiencing across the country, and especially in the 10th district, is that we have a housing shortage in the Pacific Northwest. And if we do not find ways to work with the development community and form public-private partnerships and start to get more housing online in the permitting world, then we're going to sit here, you know, five years from now talking about being in a world of hurt. So it's my hope that through the things I'm working on at the federal level, everything from the build more housing near transit act to finding ways to use federal funds to incentivize the building community to build more affordable housing but just looking back and saying how many permits are in the pipeline now to build more housing compared to where they were when i first took office i'd say the other thing too of course is having confidence that we're not going to have another you know another round of having to quarantine because we haven't defeated the pandemic and so i'm very heavy-handed about getting people vaccinated and trying to get that message out there and then finally you know economic recovery our household incomes increasing are people going back to work are small businesses feeling as though they're able to come back and get the support they need so there's those are just a few of the things that i want to do but i'd say housing and economic opportunity are probably the two biggest so th there's a lot there, that, that an overlap with the chamber's agenda. One that you may not be aware of that actually was influenced by Tom uh, and actually by my visit out a couple of years ago uh, to, to an economic forum that Tom hosted was the chamber's interest in housing policy. Uh, mm -hmm. And we worked with some of your predecessors. We'd love to work with you uh, on how we get more housing built. And so uh, we're in the process of standing up a whole program of that at the U.S. Chamber. Um, uh, we want to see you be successful in that and we want to help uh, push in that direction. So and thank you for, for raising that and mentioning it. Let me switch thank gears you. for a second. Um, I'm curious, you know, over your long career, uh, various uh, in, in the public sector and the private sector, um, is there any particular piece of advice that you've received uh, that stands out to you? And is there any particular advice that you would give to any member of our audience today who says, you know, hey, hey, you know, how can I get ahead? How can I do good for my community? No, that's a great question. You know, the piece of advice that stays with me the most is from a professor of communication that I had when I was at Clark Atlanta University. And Clark Atlanta University is one of the historically black colleges and universities. And she said to me, if you are able to communicate well and clearly and concisely, everything will become easier. And that's your ability to speak and express yourself. It's how you provide written communications and even how you communicate when you're trying to resolve conflicts. And so those things have always stayed with me. And I admittedly, I have not always been a good communicator, but it's something that you start to develop when you do it enough and you practice it over time. So I'd say that's one piece of advice. As far as advice for, you know, what we're looking at, you know, today and moving forward in a, you know, hopefully what will soon be a post pandemic world, I, you know, this, it, it sounds a bit off topic, but treasure your relationships in your families. Because I would say one thing that COVID has really done is it's amplified how vulnerable we are as people. It's, it's amplified some issues that we have about behavioral and, and mental health. And I just say folks, you know, put family first, loved ones first, make sure the people who love and care about are well aware of it before it's too late. Yeah, that is that is great advice. And you're right. I, I do think if there's a civil lining around the pandemic, you know, it has been this refocus on on family and friends and, and loved ones. Tom, I want to get you involved in here. Uh, questions uh, for for the Congresswoman. Well, I, I guess um, one of the questions I would have is it goes back to kind of what I mentioned before in terms of the South Sound. We've been in a, a, a place where we you know, we have uncommon relationships, right? So we, we focus on what what unifies us, not what divides us. What is, how have you taken that same same tactic to Congress where we know it's highly divided? And how do you kind of work work around in, in those circles to, to kind of work across, you know, whether it's party lines or different divisions that are, that you see there in, in Congress? Yeah, you know, I would say, Tom, that, you know, I always remember or I always keep top of mind that my job is to deliver for the district, for the people who sent me to Congress. And so that can be anything from passing policies that are important to them to delivering resources and, quote, bringing home the bacon for very important local projects. That's why I really believe that having the lens of local government in my time as mayor has made me a more effective member of Congress. And what that means sometimes is that, you know, 
you have to compromise, even if you have to plug your nose with something. It means that you go there with an open mind and an open heart to work with all people who want to work with you, but you never compromise your values. And so I don't compromise for the sake of compromise, but if that is going to help get something over the goal line that's going to benefit the people that I represent, then that's a good thing. And you know, sometimes people talk about trying to label you and put you in a lane. And I tell folks, I'm a proud left of center Democrat. I'm a Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris kind of Democrat because I like to actually get things done. And so as I think about you know, what it means to try to work with all people, you always want to work with all people, but you cannot compromise the values. You can't compromise for the sake of compromising. And you always remember that your job is to deliver for the people at home. And you know this about the 10th, it's diverse in every possible sense of the word. It's urban, it's rural, it's suburban, it's military, it's civilian. And there's a lot to it. And so you have to make sure that you're able to be mindful that you represent a very diverse group of people. You know, it's it's I, I love that answer in part because it actually sounded very familiar to what we heard a, a fairly conservative Republican senator uh, argue about compromise. Uh, and it, the point he, he made was that, you know, my constituents don't want a middle of the road person who doesn't have firm beliefs, who doesn't come, you know, with a particular point of view. Uh, but they also don't want someone who can't figure out a way to represent that view and still find common ground to get something done. And so uh, I hear a little bit of that from your perspective as a, as a left of center Democrat, that just because people come with, you know, their positions and their viewpoints and their values, those actually aren't barriers to getting things done. Those are actually can be enablers to getting things done. And I think that's an interesting way to think about it. And I'm, I'm curious um, in your conversations with your colleagues, particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle, yeah. how often do conversations like that come up? And how often do it come up when you're across the aisle talking to Republicans? Yeah, you know, I mean, one thing about being a member of Congress who's a freshman during COVID is that I haven't had a lot of times to physically interact with people because we've always been masked up and trying to stay safe from the pandemic. But, you know, I will give a few examples. So, you know, I am one of four Korean Americans who are now part of Congress. Two of us are Democrats, um, myself and Andy Kim, and then Young Kim and Michelle Steele are Republicans. And there have been a few instances where we have come together because they are issues related to the Korean American community that are important to us. Um, there is a military hero named Young Oak Kim, and we got together to try to honor him with a congressional medal. And so we're working on that. Um, there are things that we have worked together on regarding small businesses. And so, you know, coming back to your conversation about how we work together, you know, you know this, even within our respective caucuses, Democrats and Republicans alike, even among those groups, there isn't a full agreement on everything because everyone comes from a different district. Everyone brings a different perspective and everyone brings a different life experience. And so we have to find ways to never lose sight of the fact that people sent us to DC to do a job and that's to improve the quality of life of the people at home. So how do we find ways to come together, whether that's through the infrastructure package, whether it's through how we're going to fund our you know, national defense authorization. And for me, very personal, the whole idea of the American Families Plan, which is going to really emphasize the caregiving infrastructure, caring for our youngest and caring for our eldest. Because if you're a woman who tends to be the caregivers, who is working and trying to manage a career, Caregiving is part of your portfolio, and that crosses all political boundaries. So how do we come together to make the economy more inclusive and work on policies that we know benefit all of us? Well, you know, that that ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we all have in common, right, is that we're all looking for policies, whether you come at it from the Republican standpoint, a Democratic standpoint, business, labor. We're, we're all trying to improve the American experience and create a, a, a better life for uh, all of our fellow citizens. So, um, uh, Tom, I want to give you one last quick word here, and then I want to turn it to the Congresswoman for any uh, closing remarks. But I just have to preface it by saying um, just how wonderful and refreshing it's been to hear both of you and hear the perspectives that you're bringing uh, and how lucky the South Sound is to have business leaders and political leaders um, who engage in, in this manner. So, Tom? Well, thank you, Neil, and I appreciate the work the U.S. Chamber does and look forward to continuing this conversation as well as others. Uh, Congressmember uh, Strickland, you know, the incredible, I, I just think of your background, right? So the background, and Neil mentioned in the intro, whether it's, you know, being mayor, your private sector work, and then working at the chamber, all those things really make you 
and there's lots more. We saw your mom go back and forth there in the in the background <laughs> there. Um, and, and all those things make you an incredible leader. And so the work that we're, you know, uh, whether it's transportation, housing, workforce, all those things, we're excited to uh, continue to work with you um, in the future and make the South Sound the most equitable and, inc and inclusive place to do business in Washington State and in our nation. Thank you. Congresswoman, I almost asked you to invite uh, your mother to join us. If only I could say, you know, what a wonderful job uh, she clearly did uh, uh, raising uh, people who have a heart for their community and a heart for public service. Uh, but but we didn't want to interrupt her day. So, Congresswoman, <laughs> let me turn to you for any any final remarks. Yeah, you know, well, first of all, thank you so much for hosting us and for having me here. You know, I take great pride in the fact that the South Sound is – one of those places where we know that we have challenges, but we just find a way to come together. And, you know, I had an opportunity to work with Tom on a lot of issues, you know, from investing in mass transit in our region, from, you know, getting a very important highway extended that's going to really help with mobility with our port and with transportation, you know, working on things to really help bolster small businesses. And I'm just delighted that the program that Tom has for the Chamber of Spaceworks is working on supporting, you know, a dozen black entrepreneurs to help incubate and accelerate what they're doing. And I think the punchline for me is there's so much that we have in common. We all want the opportunity to have a job that pays well and to retire with dignity and to have good benefits. That's good for all of us. It's good for business. It's good for families. It's good for seniors. And so as I think about the South Puget Sound, we're just one of those places that gets it. We come together when it really means something. And it is my honor to represent the 10th district. As Tom said before, you know, you kind of like once a mayor, always a mayor, because I always have that lens. But being in Washington, D.C. just gives us a chance to bring much needed federal resources to help address some of our biggest challenges. So it is my honor and privilege to serve, and I look forward to working with you all. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Congresswoman Strickland, uh, it's really been an honor for, for me to get to know you a little bit uh, over the last half hour, and I know for our audience to get to know you. Uh, please count on us as allies. We look forward to working with you on uh, some of the issues you mentioned today, uh, but also just how we figure out how we get Washington working together so that it really is representing that South Sound uh, approach uh, to problem solving. We could use a little bit more of that, I think, uh, these days in the nation's capital. All right. Well, thank you so much. To our audience, thank you for joining us today, uh, the latest in our Back to Business series. Um, you can check out past episodes on our website and get to know all of the freshman members of Congress. Thanks so much, uh, and thanks for joining us today.